Good evening, everyone. Thank you so much for joining us again for our monthly webinar. Um, it is February, so we are rolling right into the new year. And we're going to talk a little bit tonight about what hazards affect um, Fairfax County. And then we're going to talk about what we're going to do with the information and how we're going to make a plan and prepare. So we're going to jump right in. We have a, a guest speaker tonight um, who you're going to hear a little bit more from. And um, it's going to be um, a great presentation. So uh, Matt Marquis is joining us. Um, he is our lead planner for the Department of Emergency Management and Security. Um, so we're going to start the presentation and um, I'll turn it over to Matt in just a minute. So just to remind you guys, um, we are doing this from our community engagement division and our preparedness program here in Fairfax County is called Ready Fairfax. Um, so just as you guys know, we're, we're going out into the community. We are talking to our residents about how to prepare for, respond to, and recover from emergencies. So we're gonna have three modules tonight. Um, module one is going to be resolved to be ready. So we're gonna talk about um, our New Year's resolutions and our plan for the year. Module two is going to be going over the hazards in Fairfax County, um, which Matt is going to do. And then we're gonna talk about what's next. So what does this year look like for us? Um, in 2023, uh, this is our preparedness calendar for the year. Um, last month, we had an introduction to preparedness, so we are mentally preparing ourselves um, to get prepared in 2023. Um, it is a marathon, not a sprint, so each month we are taking it step by step, and it's going to be a little bit slow, but I think it's more manageable if we are breaking it down and doing it piece by piece. Um, so this month, we're going over the hazards, and then next month, we are going to be going over how to make an emergency plan. And of course, the most important part is practicing it to make sure that your plan actually works. So here is um, a little bit about our presenter. Um, like I said, um, Matt is um, our lead planner here at the Department of Emergency Management and Security. Um, prior to working at DEMS, um, he worked with the Park Authority um, and Matt actually has a great story because he started with Dems as an intern. Um, he came into the community engagement division and then moved over to planning as our regional planner. And now he uh, has assumed the role of our lead planner. Um, so he's going to be able to talk to you all about planning and policy um, and how we take that and make it into plans um, in Fairfax County. So, Matt, I will turn it over to you. Yeah, thanks, Courtney. Um, so real quick, uh, you know, the big thing that we we want to talk about today or this evening, for that matter, is hazards, hazards and risks. Um, so what I do a lot of at the county level is I work to identify hazards. I work to identify risks that could adversely affect how we do business in the county. Um, so what are hazards and what are risks? So you have a couple definitions here on the screen, but a hazard is more of a, a type of incident, if you will. So a, a potential uh, hurricanes, winter storms, active violence, hazardous materials incidents, uh, train derailments. The list kind of goes on and on and on. Um, those are your hazards. And the risk associated with the hazards is the probability of that actually occurring. Um, and some of the cascading incidents, if you will, if a hazard uh, occurs, what are some of the ancillary things that are going to come around and affect uh, and amplify or make that hazard that much worse. So, you know, we look at these types of things and we want to understand what our hazards and our risks are just so that we can better prepare. What we're doing here tonight is educating everyone on these hazards and these risks, um, but we want to prepare. So we can't go into our response and recovery phases if we don't know what adversely affects the county. Uh, we do this a lot through, you know, historical, um, knowledge, looking at things that have happened in the past, you know, looking from our partners across the river in Maryland and DC, um, seeing what other metropolitan areas have to deal with. Um, and this helps us, you know, identify hazards. So you can see here, um, the real importance of hazard identification is, you know, recognizing what those hazards might be. For us, 
Um, there are a lot. Um, we try to recognize them so that we can develop uh, things that can mitigate those effects. So a perfect example of one of our mitigation projects that we've done uh, in Fairfax County in the past five years or so is the Huntington Levee. So over down by uh, 495 in Huntington, uh, we built a $42 million levee to make sure that that neighborhood down there in Huntington doesn't flood as it used to. Um, and Tropical Storm Lee uh, and the remnants of another storm uh, in 2003 and 2011. So we look at these different types of hazards, the different types of risks that are associated, associated with them, uh, and we start collecting that information and researching them and understanding them. Uh, the big thing in the county now is understanding how climate change is it's not necessarily a hazard in and of itself, but a risk um, that is amplifying the effects of hazards. So think of rainfall events now uh, are starting to become more intense, less frequent, but more intense. So we're starting to use that and understand what's happening in areas that have the same type of geography, the same type of uh, you know topography that we do, the same type of climate, environment, so on and so forth. And we understand those and we research and collect information from not just here, but everywhere around the country and around the world. And we use this to start developing, you know, our, our risk basically for those hazards. So like I said earlier, you know, the big thing is we're using that historic history that we have for Fairfax County um, to better prepare ourselves to understand uh, what's coming down the pike and actually use that for funding. Um, so we do these types of things so that we can identify, you know, two different, um, two different categories, if you will, of hazards. We have natural, pretty simple. Everyone knows what natural hazards are. Um, they're the types of hazards that are just forces of nature. Um, so you can you break them up into meteorological events. You can break them up into geological events. So volcanoes, earthquakes, following your geological events. Um, and then your meteorological ones are hurricanes or winter storms or extreme heat, which is starting to become a much more prevalent uh, hazard that we have to deal with, not just here, but around the country and around the world. Um, as the world gets warmer, the effects of extreme heat uh, are becoming more and more prevalent. And if you look at some of the National Weather Service statistics over the past five years, the most uh, lethal uh, version of natural hazards has been extreme heat. So we have our natural on one side and now we have our man-made on the other, which is broken up into two subcategories right afterwards. So technological, um, those are accidents. Accidental in nature, um, it's normally a failure of something. Um, systems or structures, the, the best way that I can say something is, uh, think of a hazardous materials incident where some sort of material is being transported by, uh, by truck or trail or train, um, and either that derails or crashes. That's a technological hazard. It wasn't intentional. Um, now there is a possibility that the person that was operating that locomotive or driving that truck had uh, nefarious intent in mind, but we assume right at the beginning that that's a technological hazard. Now your human cause stuff, it's pretty, pretty simple. That falls under the nexus of terrorism. So uh, it's defined, you know, as an intentional act committed by an adversary. And we are not, uh, you know, insulated from those types of incidents here in Fairfax County in the national capital region, given, you know, what we have in our, in our area and around us. So we have to understand these, these two bigger groups um, and look at, you know, the potential for these different types of hazards so that we can try to apply some of our mitigation efforts, some of our response efforts, some of our recovery efforts, um, so that we don't have to deal with the effects as much moving in the future. So we talked about these two things. Now, what I'm going to do here is I'm actually going to start delving pretty deep into the different types of uh, classifications and different things that are in each hazard profile. Um, so these, all these ones right here are actually developed by FEMA. Um, so you can see here that, you know, there's things like avalanches and, you know, uh, volcanic activity and wildfires. Um, now these are, are national hazards. These aren't necessarily hazards that affect Fairfax County, but we, we use this to help develop, you know, what we're going to do. So these are the main hazards that are identified at the national level we can go into each of these hazards and say which one is more prevalent for Fairfax County. We do this in our hazard mitigation planning. We do this in our threat and hazards identification and risk assessment. Uh, so you'll see here that there are a few that just 
we'll never see the effects of. We'll never have an avalanche because we don't have very high mountains with a lot of snow cover. We won't have a volcano, hopefully, um, because we don't really have that type of seismic activity and that type of geological activity that you would see on the Pacific, uh, Pacific Northwest and the Ring of Fire out in the Pacific Ocean. So these are our major natural hazard classifications that we operate within. And then we use this to derive what really affects Fairfax County. So you see here, this actually comes from our newest, uh, our newest draft of the hazard mitigation plan. I apologize. Um, it's currently not out yet uh, because we're still waiting for um, some of the you know signatures and things like that for it to get done. Uh, but this information is for the 2022-2023 uh, Northern Virginia Hazard Mitigation Plan, but it's very much the same as it was for the uh, previous version, the uh, the 2017 2018 Northern Virginia Hazard Mitigation Plan. Um, and what you see here is, you know, these are our biggest hazards. Our top three biggest hazards right here: winter storm, flood, high wind, and uh, severe storms. Now we do have some medium things, um, and it's interesting here, right? Because dam failure uh, is, you know, classified as a natural hazard, but more or less, dam, dam failures now fall into the technological hazards. So we look at these different types of hazards. We try to apply which ones, you know, are going to affect us the most. And as you can see here, and any person who's lived in Fairfax County or, or Northern Virginia or the National Capital Region for a long time. Will probably attest to the fact that when we do get winter storms, you know, i.e., the blizzard of '96, Snow uh winter storm Jonas, uh, Snow Apocalypse, Carmageddon, all those types of things, huge, huge storms that really affected and adversely affected how we do business in the entire uh, Fairfax County and the National Capital Region. Um, so here's a perfect example of um, one of our other types of hazards, one of our other types of uh, high hazards, if you will. So I'm sure many of you remember uh, the derecho of, I know it says 2022, it shouldn't, but you know, uh, people make mistakes, but it was 2012. So it was a little over 10 years ago, uh, June 29th. Um, and the big thing that happened there um, is a derecho type of storm. Um, what it does there, it's a, it's a very extreme, um line of storms um and what it does it started out in the great lakes uh, and it moved very rapidly uh through the mid-atlantic on its way to northern virginia and dc um, once it got here you can see here that the winds were ferocious uh and they did a lot of damage around the county uh we had a lot of trees down um, one of the big points that we like to drive home in emergency management uh, for Fairfax County is that, you know, 911 services were disrupted because, uh, you know, telephone uh, uh, relay equipment basically failed. Um, and a lot of our first responders had to basically go out and start to find emergencies, which is something you never want. But the big thing here was that it was a extreme event um, that was really precipitated and only took a little while um, and was very extreme. Um, and now I, I'm being told that. Uh, so we have uh, these these pictures that you see here are actually uh, some of the pictures and radar uh, signatures from from National Weather Service. Um, these are clipped from a video from some videos on uh, on YouTube. Um, so what you can do is you can actually kind of research the derecho, the Northern Virginia derecho, um, look up radar signatures, and you'll see the intensity. The, the picture up in the top right corner right there really speaks to a story of extreme winds. Um, think of the derecho that we had here as a uh, horizontal, horizontal tornado um, that came in very quick, very fast, um, and really, really disrupted up, uh, a lot of stuff going on here. So again, when we're talking about hazard classifications and, and noticing our hazards, we use this as one of our watershed moments right here because we know what the potential can be. And more or less, this was just from a, a severe thunderstorm. So if a severe thunderstorm can do this type of damage, then we better be prepared, prepared for the next one. Um, so we also have a couple other you know historical events that have happened as well. Um, the next one that we're going to talk about is Winter Storm Jonas, which happened back in uh, 2016. 
Um, so as you can see here, again, these are some radar signatures. Uh, the big thing was this was a blizzard. It snowed for a very long time. I remember uh, very clearly living in Burke, uh, the uh, warnings and kind of the, the meteorological outlooks were started that Wednesday um, and said, it's going to be extreme. It's going to be very, uh, there's going to be a lot of snow. Um, it started snowing that Friday and didn't stop snowing until probably early Sunday morning with whiteout conditions um, that Saturday, um, the 23rd of January. Um, we had, you know, 30 inches, 30 plus inches of snow in and around the county. Um, and, you know, this was part of the part of the problem was is that it snowed so much so fast that we just couldn't move and it paralyzed really a lot of the stuff that we could do in Fairfax County. Um, the Bailey's Crossroads Fire Station, Fire Station 10 out in uh, Bailey's Crossroads uh, in the northeastern portion of the county um, had the roof collapse. Uh, and, you know, it's just one of those things, right, where it's like this is a lot of snow very quickly. Uh, we can't really go on the road because it's dangerous. Uh, our ability to do emergency response to just the everyday type of calls, your, you know, your BLS basic life-saving emergency calls, your ALS emergencies, just assisting the public. We couldn't do those because it wasn't safe to go out. Um, so we did have a local state and federal disaster declaration from this just because there was so much snow that had to be moved. Um, and we really bore the brunt of this. Uh, you know, it's bad if any of you know National Weather Service, if Jim Cantori shows up to your area, that means that something something is definitely going to be there. So um, so Winter Storm Jonas is, again, you know, it falls into that winter storm category right there that we have to be prepared for. This is just one example of many that have happened over the past 30 years or so. Um, that have really affected the county. I remember being here in 96 when that happened, that that blizzard, and that that was torrential, to say the least, because then it flooded all afterwards, which kind of leads me into the next p potential thing or, uh, you know, historical event that we've had. Um, back in 2019, um, in July, I will never forget this day because um, we were sitting in our office at the Department of Emergency Management and Security, um, and my cubicle mate right to the next to me uh, was the duty officer that week. Um, and anytime you get a direct email from one of the lead forecasters from the National Weather Service that says, it's coming, you better do stuff because it's coming right now. Um, we weren't exactly sure what that meant until it started raining. And when it started raining, it didn't stop raining. And when it didn't stop raining, it intensified in rainfall. Um, to the point where we're talking, you know, five inches of rain was, uh, you know, caught basically in a, in a matter of two and a half hours. It says eight to 12 because the the rainfall kind of started right around 815-ish um, in the northern parts of the county. Um, it didn't really leave the area until about 1145-ish in the morning down in um, Alexandria, but it came across the that portion of the county right there um, and drop significant rainfall. Um, if you think about an inch of rain as basically a foot of snow, you wouldn't be that far off. Um, so think about this in a couple couple hours, we're getting this amount of you know snowfall, quote unquote. Um, it really did a lot of damage. So you can see in these pictures right here from a very small in time type of rainfall event, the type of flooding potential that it brought. So all of the estuaries and creeks that we have in and around the area started flooding. We started clocking flooding um, in areas that we normally didn't receive this type of flooding, um, mainly up in the McLean area, uh, kind of close to um, Kirby Road and near the, the CIA headquarters. Uh, all the way down to the um, to Route One and to where some of the places in Mount Vernon are. Uh, we got a, like I said, a lot of rainfall and we were activated at the EOC that day. Um, and then we actually had a local disaster declaration and a small business association declaration. Um, and even with that amount of rainfall, it's a small incident, more or less. Uh, but it's something that really adversely affected Fairfax County, as well as our partners in uh, uh, Arlington County. So with all that said... You know, I've given you a couple examples of the types of things that have happened. We still are, you know, this is this is not meant to keep you from preparing. 
we still have a very low risk index uh, for natural hazards, which is great because, um, you know, we don't really see a lot of them all that much. Um, our top ones are, you know, there are small and, you know, in potential. Uh, they do bring things that are never fun. You know, last year we had those two tornadoes touchdown in Tyson's Corners. Um, they were EF zero, but, you know, that's that's just the way it is. But as you can see here from FEMA's uh, National Risk Index, um, we are one of the smallest or one of the lowest risk scores in the entire nation. Um, and there's a lot of different things that go into it. You can see here that they talk about expected annual loss, um, social vulnerability and community resilience. Um, when the expected loss is higher and the social vulnerability is low and the community resilience is high, that means that our communities are very well prepared um, to respond and recover. And there's a lot of different uh, variables that go into that, i.e., you know, our you know, our socioeconomic status as a county um, is pretty, pretty, um, pretty high up there amongst the entire country. I think we're third or fourth now. I can't remember exactly, but we have the ability to do a lot of stuff in Fairfax County. Uh, our public safety partners are some of the most well-trusted people in Fairfax County, the most, the best trained type of people. So we have the ability to respond, recover, and move things very quickly in the county that allows us to have such a low national uh, national risk index when it comes to natural hazards. So that's good. With that said, though, I don't want to give anyone the uh, the idea that there isn't still potential for natural hazards to really wreak havoc in the area. Uh, one of the things we really are scared of at you know the apart the Department of Emergency Management and Security, and I believe at our uh, Public Works Department. Um, and some of the other places are if a hurricane comes up the Chesapeake Bay or the Potomac River um, and is a category two, category three in strength, that's going to do a lot of problems here, mainly just from the rainfall, but the wind as well. So, again, remember, we talked about hazard versus risk. If that hazard comes, the risk of massive power outages, uh, backup generators, you know, being able, not able to respond appropriately, having to shelter people goes way, way up. So um, we just have to be prepared for those types of hazards. And like I said, we, we use all the historical data to put those as our top hazards. So our three top natural hazards are uh, winter storm, flash flood, um, and also uh, severe storms and uh, you know high winds is kind of one of the big things. So we talk about nat natural. And remember, we have that other bucket here, which is human cost or man-made, if you will. Um, and we have those two subgroups that's technological and um, and human caused in, in, in essence. So you can see on the screen here that there are a few different things, uh, technological hazards. Again, we've had these things happen here. Uh, maybe not necessarily a mine accident, but utility disruptions, absolutely. Uh, and maybe a levy failure, hopefully that will never happen, but now there's a potential. We have a levy, there, there's a potential of that. Train derailment, they have happen all the time. Maybe not as, as you know, horribly as we see on the news, but we have trains, the Metro trains slip the track every now and then. Um, Amtrak's sometimes, you know, have incidents. Um, and then hazardous materials. Uh, if you knew how many hazardous, hazardous materials run on our rails or on our major highways, you might be a little concerned. I know that in 2018, we had a gas uh, you know, trailer uh, that had a lot of fuel on it crash at the American Legion Bridge. Granted, they were able to stop it from spilling everywhere, but the potential for it to spill, it possibly ignite, pour into the Potomac and just disrupt traffic all the time, right? We have to deal with traffic all the time. So it's accidental in nature, but there's still a very huge potential for it. So back in, I want to say 99, for those of you who are around here, uh, we had a little uh, traffic accident, if you will, not so little, um, at the Springfield Mixing Bowl uh, over where uh, 95 turns into 395 and 495. Um, and a cargo truck carrying 34,000 pounds of basically gunpowder uh, crashed and overturned. Um, and it took forever. 
to remove all those materials um, and to get traffic flow back to where we needed it to be. So some of the big things I know that some of you are already thinking about is, first of all, traffic is already abysmal. Now you're going to tell me that you're going to shut down I-95 northbound for multiple hours at the mixing bowl. You got to be crazy. And then we're going to start evacuating people in and around the Springfield area because we are unsure if this ignites, how big is the blast going to be? So you start to see these types of things snowball, right? So this is just a, more or less a traffic accident. But once the first responders show up there and realize that it's got hazardous materials on it, there's a potential for a big boom. And now we're going to have to deal with the consequences of traffic being snarled for, at this rate, multiple days in, in Northern Virginia. That's a huge, huge risk that we incur if, if something like that happens at one of our critical thoroughways, like I-95 northbound, 66, uh, Route 7, 495, Route 50, so on and so forth. So accident right there, accidental in nature. We are not precluded from people with bad intentions, though. Um, and we've had them happen before. Everyone knows, you know, one of the biggest watershed moments in emergency management was 9-11. Uh, so it was a terrorist attack. Um, obviously, people with nefarious intent um, that wanted to hurt and or kill people for a, a religious or political uh, ideology. Um, those things happen all the time. Um, and so we have to also prepare for those types of things. So we have a bunch of different incidents or hazards that fall within the human cause stuff. Most of it is, you know, chemical, biological, radiological, nuclear, um, very low probability of those things happening, but very high pop problems occurring from those. Um, the big thing nowadays is cyber um, and kind of active shooter stuff, which a lot of people get a lot of training on active shooter interventions. Um, but cyber attacks can be just as deadly, um, especially if someone knows what they're looking for. So a particular incident that happened um, that isn't 9-11 um, that actually occurred within Fairfax County was during 2022. So uh, I'm going to I'm going to date myself here. So I apologize. Um I was 12 years old. I went to Robinson High, uh, Robinson Secondary School in Fairfax. Uh, I was in seventh grade. So my sixth grade year was 9-11. My seventh grade year was the DC Beltway sniper attacks. Um, and being at school, so this again is kind of one of those things that's just a, a risk associated with this, a person driving around with a uh, automatic rifle or a semi-automatic rifle, shooting people at distances of unknown range. Um, and really completely random meant that we had to go inside. Uh, we weren't allowed to be outside and we were inside for the better part of a month uh, for gym. So Robinson's one of the bigger schools in Fairfax County, a couple thousand kids in a sweaty gym. It's not never fun. But ultimately, these two gentlemen, uh, one who's still in prison, uh, had a bunch of uh, radical uh, ide ideologies. Um, and took it out on people in and around the area. Um, the picture that you see here is actually from uh, Seven Corners, uh, right on the border in between Arlington County and Fairfax County, where one of their victims uh, was actually shot uh, and killed in the parking lot of the Home Depot right there. And those are all the uh, police cadets out there uh, doing evidence recovery for them at the time. Um, it took a few weeks, um, but we finally got the bad guys. But again, this essentially paralyzed the region. We had multiple police checkpoints everywhere, uh, people getting stopped, frisked, white vans, uh, the white van theory, uh, kids not allowed to go outside, people putting uh, tarps up at gas stations so that they wouldn't get shot. Um, and this is all from, you know, one gun and two gunmen. And it more or less paralyzed the entire region for the better part of three weeks. So again, this is just another example of a human cause incident when someone has the uh the drive and want to um can really do a lot of damage to how we do business in fairfax county and beyond so those are your you know a few examples that fall into each of the different hazard classifications so your natural um your man-made so your technological and your human cost right um so the question that we're trying to allude to is how do we use these so 
I've kind of already been hitting at it most of the time right here, but we use this so that we can evaluate the risks and the hazards in the county so that we can better prepare for them. Uh, we try to do this to develop a, a HIRA or a hazard identification and risk assessment for a hazard mitigation plan, um, which we're required to submit to our uh, state partners at VDEM and also uh, our federal partners at FEMA uh, for them to basically understand what we think are our biggest risks and how we plan to implement strategies over the next five or so years to, uh, to fix those. Uh, we also develop a FIRA, which is the same thing as a high risk, except it adds threats. So like I talked about, you know, some of the risks, uh, now we try to measure that up against the potential for them to happen. So what are our biggest threats uh, and our hazards? How do we identify them and how we uh, get risks for them? Um, basically, the thyra portion of this and how we utilize these hazards is to do an audit of our public administration for the county and for the, the region. Um, basically see where we're deficient and where we can improve, uh, where we're good and where we are sustaining our ability or where we've gained abilities. Um, and it's a good way to understand, you know, what we're able to do. Um, we also have to do this to uh, apply for funding um, through the state, um, through Homeland Security, through FEMA, so on and so forth. Um, and then we also utilize this to promote our outreach techniques um, so that people understand specific actions that they need to take um, in the event of X. Um, so some of the things that we've done to do that, right, are the CERG, which I'm sure many of you have heard of, but if you've never heard of it, that's great, um, because this was kind of a joint process that we did in the Planning and Policy Analysis Division and the Community Engagement Division, where we wanted to create an emergency operations plan for the people. Um, so we gave templates, we gave understanding of what goes into a basic emergency kit, uh, we talked about the hazards that are in the county. We talked about what to do before, during, and after a hazard. And then we also talked about how you can stay informed and how you can get involved so that you can be better prepared for these types of things if and when they occur. Um, so, you know, I've talked a lot about this stuff. Um, and what I wanted to do is also just show you that we have done a lot to make sure that the public understands what our biggest hazards are. All of those hazard profiles, again, are in the CERG. This is just one of the examples for our natural one. We also have another one for our technological one, which is our hazardous material stuff. And then we also have another one for our human cause, which is the acts of violence and terrorism. So again, at the end of the day, we do a lot at um, the Department of Emergency Management and Security to make sure that we identify what our biggest hazards are, what our biggest risks are, how we can learn from them, how we can respond to them more effectively and efficiently, how we recover from them more effectively and efficiently, and how we make sure that the residents of Fairfax County are better prepared uh, and in a better position if these things do occur and when these things do occur, that we can minimize the loss of life, loss of uh, property, loss of environmental damage, um, so on and so forth. And I think at the end of the day, you know, this is kind of what it looks like right here is that um, we take these all these different hazards and we look at their consequence and their likelihood, and that basically assigns the risk to them. So I know it's probably hard to see on your screens right here, but this is found in our pre-disaster recovery plan. Um, and this kind of shows you what we have uh, assigned as our biggest potential consequences and most likely to happen. Um, this will probably change and will constantly change depending on what's happening in and around the world. But this is, again, how we constantly reevaluate hazards, how we constantly reevaluate risk so that we can change this, you know, this graphic up a little bit so that we understand more, more or less what's going to affect us the most. Um, so my, my final thing to you all before I turn it back over to Courtney is understand what hazards we have utilize the CERG, utilize your past experiences um, and bring that to other people so that they have a better idea of what potential uh, can happen um, so that we can minimize any sort of loss of life, loss of property um, and stabilize incidents moving forward. So I hope you all learned something. Again, uh, you'll have an email at the end. If you have any other questions about hazards and or risks to the county, I'm more than happy to answer any of them for you. Um, and yeah, thank you, Courtney, uh, for letting me talk about that for a little while. Thank you, Matt. Um, this was a really great overview and it 
it's going to really help our residents um, understand how we come up with the different hazards that we put in the CERG. Um, so right now, um, just to align uh, with updating our plans, um, we are updating the CERG. Um, it's not going to change all that much, but we do have some things and lessons learned that we have gone through over the past couple of years, um, especially um, after dealing with the COVID-19 pandemic. So um, those will probably come out a little bit later this year, um, and we are really looking forward to that. So what's next? Um, we have been doing these every month, and we are definitely going to be sticking um, with doing webinars monthly. We've gotten uh, great feedback, and a lot of our partners are interested in coming on um, and being guests on our show. So um, next month, uh, we are going to talk all about preparedness. Um, so what we can do before to ensure that we're ready for an emergency. So there are five steps in preparedness, um, and you will find all of these outlined in the Community Emergency Response Guide. Um, but we're going to go through step one and step two next month. Um, so we're going to go over how you make a plan. So how we start it, um, we're going to go through some templates that we have, some things to consider, um, especially if you have um, individuals in your family with disabilities or access and functional needs. Um, we're going to go through how you take all of that into consideration when you're making your plan. In addition to that, we are going to talk about how you practice your plan. So some scenarios that you can consider, some things that you can do at home, um, you know, with your kids, with your family, and how we can just use everyday emergencies that happen to just talk through what we would do. Um, so we're going to go over that next month. Um, and that's going to be on March 1st again. Um, so we're February 1st today. So March 1st is our next one. Um, and then we're actually going to have two um, special webinars in March as well. So the second week in March is Severe Weather Awareness Week. So we are going to talk more about severe weather and dive a little bit deeper into that. So stay tuned. And then the third week in March is actually Flood Awareness Week. Um, so we're going to have some special guests on to talk to us all about flooding. Um, and we'll have some really great information um, to share with you guys. I did just want to remind you that we do have our calendar up to date. Um, so if you visit our Ready Fairfax page, um, we have everything up there. So you can see March March 1st, we're gonna do um, a webinar and then we're, we're gonna do one on the 15th. And we have coming up in March as well, um, an event that we're doing at Providence Community Center with um, the, our Department of Neighborhood and Community Services and it's going to be preparedness awareness weekend where you can come and see emergency kits uh, we're going to lay them out we're going to talk you through how to make them and many of our partners will be able to join us there um, and then following that we are actually going to be um, hosting two classes in person at the providence community center one is going to be an introduction to preparedness so kind of going you know, going through all of this, what the CERG is, how to use it, um, and we'll talk in person and a little bit more in depth. And then on April 26th, we are going to be having a session on until help arrives. So what you can do until the first responders can get there. Um, and this obviously is aimed more at, um, you know, those active violence events, um, or if you come up on a car accident um, or some kind of injury, um, what you can do before the first responders get there. So we're really, you know, taking the time this year um, and being very strategic about the things that we do. So if you follow this calendar um, and check back periodically, you'll be able to see all the different things that we have going on. And as always, um, if you guys ever have a um, group that would like a presentation or a workshop, um, we do offer several different workshops. One includes um, just our, our typical community emergency response guide workshop um, that we can bring out into your community. We have a five-step neighborhood guide. So if you have an HOA or 
um, Civic Association and you guys are looking to make a more in-depth plan in your neighborhood, we can come out um, and facilitate a workshop and also help you put together your plan. Um, so those are different things that we can offer. Um, we also have a business disaster resilience workshop um, that goes along with our business disaster resilience guide. So if you know anyone who owns a business that's interested um, in learning how to keep your operations going while, you know, you might be dealing with an emergency or disaster, um, we also have that. So if you have any questions, um, please feel free to email us. Um, you can always submit a um, request for a presentation on our Ready Fairfax page as well. So thank you guys so much for joining us again, and we look forward to seeing you in March.